Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome back to the Yibane Beit Midrash. Welcome home to Torah. A very warm, warm welcome back to Torah. And we are in Parshish Ve'era. Now, I just want to give a, a little bit of a spiel. Hang in there for one or two minutes. I want to remind everybody, what we do here is we're going on a journey. We're going to, like, delve in deep into the story that the, that the clear car, that the clear car is going to unravel. He's going to, we're going to see Rashi's that seem closed. And he's going to expound upon them. He's going to unravel. He's going to open them up. Rashi is a mafteach. He's a key to help us understand the Torah itself because he brings sources from the oral Torah. And the Kliyakar is like a mafteach to the mafteach. A key to the key. Unbelievable. Now, keep in mind that what we're doing is there are going to be many opinions, but we're going to use his storyline. So for those who want to learn Hebrew, and I encourage you, encourage you to do so, right, on our website, which you can find the link down below in the, in the, in the uh, YouTube, um, what do you call it, the description box, you'll find a link. And you just have to find which book, which Parsha, which year, and I encourage you to follow with the source sheets along with us. I also want to mention this is the last class of the fiscal year that we're in right now. And Yibane is uh, having a um, end of the year uh, fundraising campaign. We're in the last 24 hours and we've already reached 90% of our goal. And we're, we're looking forward to uh, giving you the opportunity to share in the wonderful work that we're doing. And uh, that's all I can say. That's all I want to say is there's a link down below in the description box where you could reach deep down into your uh, cryptic pox, pockets, right? your uh, online digital pocket, and uh, you can donate through credit card or any other way you want. <clears throat> okay, and I actually want to make sure that everyone who has donated, because we had an unbelievable response, and I want to thank you all personally. Right now, right now, here we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, here we go. We are in, as I mentioned, Ve'eram. Now we're in chapter 6, verse verse 2. Chapter 6, verse 2 of Exodus. And what we're going to deal with is actually a previous verse. In fact, we'll have to deal with previous verses. We're going to go back to uh, chapter 5, verse 22. Uh, we'll read chapter 6, verse 1. But before we do, let's begin a little out of order. I mean, we're in Parsha's day, so we'll start with the first Pusik of chapter 6. So, it says over there in the first, the, well, <laughs> ch chapter 6, verse 2. It says, God spoke to Moses and he said to him, I am the Lord. Now we'll do the Hebrew because this will, let's say, lay the groundwork for some of the anom anomalies and some of the questions we should all have if we only knew what we were reading, right? That's why you have to learn Hebrew. And that's why you have to learn Torah the way the Jewish people are teaching it. Here we go. It says, V'yadaber Elohim el Moshe, V'yomer Elav ani Hashem. Now, the word V'yadaber, as opposed to the word V'yomer, we know have very distinct, in the Hebrew anyway, understandings, interpretations, connotations. So the word V'yadaber and V'yomer, you could simply translate into English as spoke. But no, 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 no. We're going to use the word V'yadabir as spoke and the word V'yomer as say. Okay? And when you say something in Hebrew, V'yomer, it's a different type of a speech. One is harsh and one is soft. So V'yadabir is the harsh language. V'yomer is the soft language. And then in the first part of the verse, it says V'yadabir Elohim. Elohim as a verse to Ani Hashem. So Elohim is one of God's names which represents a certain characteristic of judgment, of din, okay, of harshness, again. So it matches up. 
towards the end of the verse where it says, V'yomer e'lav ani Hashem yudkei vavkei. So there's something we'll call symmetrical here, where we're, we're using the word, not we're using, the Torah uses the word, <coughs> the Yomer, God speaking to Moses, saying, Ani Hashem. But who is he speaking to? It says, Elav. That's very strange. I don't, even, I don't even know if you need the word Elav there at all. Because God says to Moses, <laughs> Ani Hashem. Why, why, you could just shorten the whole thing. Right? You, don't even, you don't even need the word, the Yomer Elav. Obviously, they're there to tell us a message. There's a deep message, and there's not just one message. There are multiple messages, but we're going to use just one. In fact, the clear card tells us there's three main points, and he's only going to use one of them, and that's the only one that we're going to discuss tonight, just one of them. Now, I want to refer back. I'm not sure we should. Let's just see. At some point, we have to go back to those previous verses. You know what we're going to do? We'll do it in, t in, in the right time. Let's open up the clear car on the first page where it says, our verse, V'yidaber Elohim el Moshe v'yomer elav ani Hashem. So the word elav, according to the clear car, is miyutar legamre. It seems su totally superfluous. It's not necessary. Right? Why? Ki kavar his kir shemosha Moshe. We already know in the beginning of the verse who God is speaking to. So you don't need to say he spoke to him. Right? It is, um, everyone's with me. God spoke to Moses and said, I'm Yashem. Okay. Venir lefaresh al derek sha'amru chazal. So he begins by bringing in a medrash agado that actually explains Moshe's name. So Moshe, what did Batya do? Remember, Batya picked him up out of the Nile. And she called him Moshe because of Mishoi, Mishoi, because he was drawn out of the water. Now the word Mishoi should have been, that's the word she uses. That word, that could have been his name because you were drawn out? No. She wanted to teach him something. And, and I have here a uh, comment from the Medrash itself. Interesting. So I just want to... Stop for a second and, and mention what Reb Samson, Samson Raphael Hirsch mentions just in terms of what is a name, right? You find clues about a person's personality in the name itself. Now I'm going to read this to you. You don't have this on your sheets. Although Batya conceived the name. Now how did she come up with this name? We believe in Judaism, right? In the, our thought that when a person, when a parent names a child, there is a sense of Ruach HaKodesh. There's a sense of divine inspiration that is coming down when you utter the name the first time, especially in public, and make uh, the person's name this name. It's as if it's something mystical that they have to live up to. Some part of their DNA, the makeup of their essence. Now, it's not their true essence. Now, listen to what Rav Samson Raf Raphael Hirsch says. That Batia conceived the name as a reminder of Moses' rescue from the Nile River. But she did not call him Mishoi, which means one drawn up from the water. Now that would be past tense. She didn't call him Mishoi, past tense. But rather she called him Moshe, one who draws others out. In other words, it's present tense. It's a constant motion of drawing out. And that's important because that's Moses' name. That's, in other words, we know from the Medrash, from other places, he has many names. He has seven names, but this is the most famous name. <laughs> so this is, the Torah, this is the name the Torah uses. This indicates the direction in which the noble princess educated her foster son, meaning Batya, she's the noble princess, and she uh, educated her own, we'll call her own foster son, right? She adopted him as a son. The deep impression that she made on his character from the very beginning. By giving him this name, she was saying to him, all your life, you were never to forget that you were abandoned in the river and that I drew you out of it. It's very interesting because we're talking about a leader. This is part of the topic tonight, talking about a leader. His name was Moshe. There was a constant reminder of not only where he came from, meaning he was abandoned, he had trauma, right, whatever it was, but more than that, what are you going to do about it? And he was able to pick himself up by his bootstraps, as they say, and emulate 
a redeemer because that is what, as we'll, we'll, you will see the Kliakar's um, poetic use of Hebrew, of Lashon HaKodesh, to describe what Moses' job is in this world. So by giving him this name, she was saying to him, all your life you're never to forget you were abandoned in the river and that I drew you out of it. This memory shall teach you to have a soft heart for others, for other people's troubles. I mean, this is an amazing thing because a lot of people have asked me in the last few weeks, what makes a leader? And wow, look at this. We're coming across Moshe's, um, you know, uh, occupation, so to speak, right? What does his CV look like? What did he write in his, uh, you know, what are his qualities, right? So one of the things we discussed already last week, how he went out of his way to uh, shepherd Jethro's flocks, and as we know, went out of his way to find uh, the, the one that goes astray and to bring him back, and he was very empathetic, and he carried him on his shoulders. And we also saw David, what made him unique as a shepherd, and that he made sure the most vulnerable of the shepherds, uh, the, of the sheep, were taken care of, very empathetic. And to always be ready to be a Moshe, which means a deliverer in times of distress. I don't want to go too much further, but there is this idea uh, Rav Chaim Shmulevitz brings down, um, which is a slightly different approach. He demonstrates at length that a human being has the power to invest in another person. And that's what Batya did. She invested a tremendous amount. And not only can you invest in a human, you can even invest in an inanimate object and I'm not going to go into this, but you can invest a spiritual quality into an inanimate object. As we know, when Elisha was not able to go and uh, resurrect uh, the dead boy back to life, he sent Gehazi with some sticks, and using the sticks that he invested this, let's say, this power, this uh, spiritual uh, potential in. So we see that even in physical objects. So this is very real. By the way, for those who are not familiar, this is a very metaphysical metaphysically charged class, right? We we're focusing a lot on what's behind the scenes, right? Not just the physical, but the power of the spirit. Okay, so now I covered that. I want to go back into the Kliakar. And he mentions what we just said, that his name is Moshe, and it's not Mishoy. Lefi Shemoshe Loshen Hoive. Because the language of Moshe is present tense. He's a deliverer, not past tense. He wasn't drawn out only, but he's constantly drawing out. The Ruach Hashem diber bebat paro likroto Moshe. And therefore, as I mentioned, that the Spirit of God, some Ruach HaKodesh, uh, holy inspiration, came down and assisted Batya in naming Moses that name. Why? It's the Lashon of Moshe Umoshech. Moshe Umoshech. It's a language of drawing out and continually drawing out. Because he is the deliverer. He is the one who draws out. Now just think about this. It's unbelievable. I'm going to say something very profound. We call Moshe Rabbeinu Moshe Rabbeinu because he is our teacher. Not that he was our teacher. Right? Not that he only taught 3,300 years ago to 600,000 men and between the age of 20 and 60. He is our teacher today. Unbelievable. I'm going to tell you something else. Uh, there's, a, there's a Gemara that says that if you teach your grandson's Torah, it's as if you yourself are standing on Mount Sinai receiving the Torah. I mean, it's a little bit uh, counterintuitive because you would, I would say if you teach your grandson Torah, it's like your grandson would be standing at Mount Sinai. Right? Because you, we know we have a transmission all the way back. But the very fact that you're teaching the next generation or two or onward, it's you are actually making that connection in the other, in the other uh, direction as well. In other words, you're strengthening that metaphysical chain. It's a very interesting idea that it says, it's as if you're standing at Mount Sinai. It doesn't mention your grandchild standing at Sinai. Okay, anyway, I want to go forward with this because Moshe Rabbeinu is our teacher. And when we're learning the Torah, we're learning directly from him in a, in, a, in a great sense. Isn't that amazing? Now, so he is the Moshech of Israel. He's the one who draws Israel min galut from the exile. Min hamayim hazedonim, from the polluted um, and co contaminated waters. And we all have in our lives, right? If any of us had trauma or any of us had some interesting experiences growing up or right, even in, as an adult, right? Who else is going to bring us up 
out of um, out of the uh, let's say out of the tumor, other than the Torah itself, Hashem Himself, and Moshe was let's just use the word intermediary. He was the teacher of it. Now, if Moses would have examined his name properly, and maybe he did, but if he would, then he would know the truth. He would know the absolute truth about himself, that he would know and understand that he is the Redeemer, that through him the Jewish people would be redeemed. And if that was true, that he really understood this perfectly, completely, the assumption here, according to the Kliyakar, is he never would have argued with God, complained to God, um, when, or even provoked God. Whatever Tigar usually means to, to argue. Remember what he says in chapter, we're going back now to that verse, chapter 5, verse 22. He says, Lama Zeshulachtani. Not only that, he also said, Lama Hareyota. So let's go and look at what it says in chapter 5, verse 22. So Moses returned to the Lord. He already went to, he already went to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh made things worse, right? So he said, O Lord. Okay, Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you harmed this people? Why have you sent me? Now we're going to get to verse 23 in a second. But let's see the Hebrew. So, the Yoshev Moshe El Hashem... Moses responds or returns to God. The Yomer, and he says, Adoni, my harayota la'amazeh. Why have you made it more difficult? Why have you brought more harm to this people? Lamazeh shalachtani. Why did you send me? Remember, if Moses understood two things, we have to understand both things. One is that he was the Redeemer, and there's also certain trust in Hashem that they would be redeemed. In other words, when you see things getting worse, what's the problem? God promised, you have to have some patience, right? Do we sense a little bit of impatience? Well, remember, Moses' a personality is he's willing to take on the burden of the people. We're going to talk more about that shortly. But that is also a trait of a leader, to be empathetic, benevolent, right? Loving, caring, um, but to b carry the burden of the people. That is um, a trait of a leader. So why not? Right? Then you know what? If it's burdensome to me, maybe I want to get rid of that burden quicker. Maybe that's a fault in a leader. Let's see. Now, so far, we, we're going to see Ach Nitzad Echad Yesh Moshe. Now, there's going to be two sides. Remember, Fiddler on the Roof. On the one hand, and on the other hand. So we're going to see two hands. On the one hand, Mitzad Echad. You could actually judge Moshe favorably. Why? Maybe he did check out his essence. But you know what he saw? He actually saw, right? You could, it's called cognitive dissonance if you don't see it. Right? We have a lot of that going on in the world right now, right? I call it now data hesitant. <laughs> anyway, so let's move on. So basically, Moses saw himself with a speech impediment, with a heavy mouth and tongue. So he could have said very easily, I don't see, I'm, I'm not the right guy. I'm not the best guy. Even if I was charismatic, or am charismatic, there's, you know, people are going to watch me... Um, What's the word? With ellipse or whatever it is that someone with a speech impediment does and stum thinks stum stuttering. <laughs> stuttering is a good word. And therefore, it, you know, how charismatic can a stutterer be? And that's why now we're going to go back into the verses. It says, the adaber, the adaber is lashen kashe. The adaber is a language that's harshness, that God spoke to him with harshness. And it says, the adaber who? The adaber elukim. That the name elukim. Ze midas hadin. That is the character trait of, of, um, of judgment. And who did he speak to? El Moshe. The name is mentioned. Lomar, what is this all saying to us? Shuroi li hadin, that it was actually fitting to judge Moshe. Al shalom badak bishmo Moshe. That he didn't carefully examine his own name, knowing who his mission in life was. 
which we already explained was to be the deliverer. Ulahavin mitocho shuye Moshech, Moshe u Moshech is shram in a galut. And to understand on his own, through his own investigation, to understand that he will be the deliverer, the one who draws Israel out from exile. Now that's on one side. Um zeh, I'm sorry, on continuing on this idea, mitzad zeh, from this aspect, lo yelomar, he never would have complained or argued with God by saying, lama heireota, why did you make it any worse for them? Now that's on one side. Ach mitzad muto, now we will have to understand, I understand, maybe I'm not the right guy for the job, why did you send me? But to say to God, you made it worse? We'll have to, we're going to go into that a little bit further. Ach mitzadatz muto. Now, from the aspect of who Moses' own essence was, nitmale Hashem olav rachamim. Hashem, yudke vavke, that aspect of God, was full of mercy towards Moshe. And that's why it says the yomer, right? The latter part of the verse. And God said, as opposed to spoke, right? I know in English you may not feel the difference between said and spoke. But feel the Hebrew. V'yidaber versus V'yomer. V'yomer said, Mira Raka. The word Raka means soft, kind. Elav. He spoke to him. Bishvil Mahut Atzmo. On account of who he really is inside. His inner essence. Kimeyacher shayakavet peva lashon. Akomol libo lomar. See, after the fact that he was a stutterer. He did have a speech impediment. Um, therefore, uh, he, his heart was filled, meaning God had mercy. When, God, when, um, when Moses says, Lama zesh alaktani, you know, very nice. You, you're wondering why I'm sending you? So Bishvil Olav. On account of Olav, again, it's his essence, he says, Ani Hashem. I am God, Yudke Vavke which is Mar Arachamim, which reflects and teaches Moses, I, I, I'm going to overlook that. I am going to forgive you for your, your argumentative uh, constitution. Kishmo umuhutu sasre adadi. Now, we have to understand, this paragraph ends knowing that these two aspects of his name and what it represents and who he is in his essence do seem to contradict each other. They seem to go, uh, there's a con- let's use the word conflict. There's a conflict. There's a conflict between who he is and what his name represents. And that's why it says, Ani Hashem, I am Yudke Vavke, Amale Rachamim Liduncha Lechavskut. I'm going to be full of mercy and judge you favorably. Now that's the first paragraph. Before we approach the second paragraph, I mentioned that the Kliakar has several several different uh, ways to explain this. So we're going to go to the next page. Okay, so as I mentioned, we are going to continue with Derek Shani. Behemshech Pesukim Eluhu. In other words, there's a flow of the verses. She'en Elohim Eladin. We have to know this, right? It's described in Gemara Yuma uh, 87a that the word Elohim can only mean judgment. Okay? Um... I'm looking back at the Rashi on the first. Interesting. Let's go on page one of the English source sheet. You have where he said to him, I am the Lord. This is within Rashi. So what does it mean when God said, I need Yudke Vavke, I am Hashem. I am faithful to recompense all those who walk before me. In other words, I will reward those. I did not send you to Pharaoh except to fulfill my words. Okay? We're in Rashi, down by the bottom, okay, on page one. So, I, I sent you on a mission, which I spoke to the early fathers. What's the mission? To take us out of Egypt and bring us back to Israel. Okay, now he promised our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, what happened with that promise? He never fulfilled it then. It's only, you know, we we'll say within 400 years. Within, right, because Avraham was promised 400 years earlier, then Isaac was promised X amount of years later. Yaakov was also promised. So within 400 years, but guess what? That was never fulfilled until now. And yet you're complaining? In other words, they never complained. You're already saying to me, right, you're making things worse? Well, let's just see. So I spoke to them. So in this sense, we find that when he says, Ani Hashem, 
we do interpret in many, many places in Scripture as I am the Lord, which could mean that I will fulfill or exact retribution. But, and it has this meaning when it's stated only in conjunction with a punishment. There's no punishment here, right? When there's a punishment. Or if you, here's an example in Leviticus 19.12. Or you will profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. So when there's a punishment with the name of Yudke Vavke, that means God saying, I am true to my word. You will receive that punishment, no doubt. But when it's stated in conjunction with the fulfillment of commandments, you shall keep, like in Leviticus 22.31, you shall keep my commandments and perform them. I am UK Vavke. It means I'm faithful to give reward. Okay? So we understand, at least in UK Vavke, that, it is, um, that there's mercy involved in certain circumstances. Okay, let's go back into the clear car. He mentions, as I mentioned in Gumar Yuma, the word Elohim means din. Now, if that's true, lo perushadayin be'ezedin dono kadosh baruchu. So in our verse, where we're dealing with, with the words v'idaber elokim el Moshe, that God spoke to Moshe, what judgment is coming down? Wait. You just have to go back to the last verse, the previous two verses. We're, and this is amazing, because when we think, why did Moses not enter the land of Israel? Right, if you notice... The title I gave on the English sheet is The Leadership Role of Moshe, why, why He Did Not Enter the Land and He Seemed to Have Needed to Die in the Desert. It's a great question. And we're going to get the answer to that. Now, of course, there's many answers, but this is one of the true answers. Okay. So go back to, um, I mentioned already, it's Auto Tiria Shea Seleparo. If you go, to uh, f- chapter 5, verse 22, right above on the, on the top of page 1. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, That's the verse? No, sorry. Uh, it's actually 6 1, right? Yeah, yeah six, uh, chapter 6, verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a mighty hand. He will send them out. And with a mighty hand, he will drive them out of, this, of his land. So I want to just explain a little bit what's going on here. When God says to Moses, he says in Hebrew, Oto, ayin, tafhe, now, now you will see what I am going to do to Pharaoh. Keep, right? So we're going to explain that. As what? Rashi says, <clears throat> so I want you to again look at Rashi, but it's in the middle. It's actually, more, it's like on the top half towards the middle, where it says, now you will see. Now, God is telling him, you know, you question my ways of running the world. Unlike Abraham, unlike Abraham, for I said, to whom I said, what did God say to Abraham? You know, you're going to have a son Isaac. He's going to be your progeny and everything's going to be great. But then he told Avraham to sacrifice Isaac. And Avraham didn't complain. Why? Because he believed God that what? That it will be fulfilled eventually. Eventually. So if not now, when? It's okay. Okay, and also, Isaac was promised, and it didn't happen in his lifetime, and he didn't question it either. When, um, at least, let's say, you know, when he was put up as a burnt offering, also Isaac didn't question it. Therefore, now you will see. God's telling Moses, now you're going to see what is going to be done to Pharaoh. That I will show you. That you will see. But not what is going to be done to the kings of the seven nations when I bring them into the land of Israel. Amazing. We think that when Moses hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock, that's when the decree came and said, you're you're no longer going to go into the land of Israel. So I want to tell you the decree was already made here. But it was sealed over there. You understand the difference? Moses already had an inkling of not going in. Now, because God says, I'm going to show you now what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. But you're not going to go in. It was already decreed. You're not going to go in. Okay, now. And, and oh, the, the next Rashi is also, when it says, V'yadabar Hashem el Moshe. So we also saw the name Elohim, and we saw the idea of Moshe. 
It says he called him to account because he, Moshe, spoke harshly by saying, why have you harmed this people? In other words, that's why the judgment is on Moshe. Clear as mud so far. So now we're going back into the clear car where he says, the last thing we just mentioned was that we're going to have a smichut. Smichut means there's a proximity to our verse, chap, right, chapter 6, verse 3, where we have this harsh judgment on, on Moshe, and it's going back and it's relating to a, a harsh judgment that was just mentioned, which is this. Now you will see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh, as Chazal explained, and Rashi quoted it, that you're, you're not going to see what I'm going to do to the seven um, Canaanite nations. Now, it's true in Sanhedrin 111a, we can go into it, but I want to just stick with the, the piece for a second. The word, according to the clear card, the word malche, lamalche, is near a yitur. It seems superfluous. What do you need even the words? If you're going to say, you're not going to see what I'm going to do to the seven nations. Why do you need to add the word the kings? And I'll tell you why. Because in Gomorrah Sanhedrin, it actually mentions 31 kings. So if you want to take a look real quick at Sanhedrin 111a, towards the very bottom, towards the very bottom, um, then the verse says, now shall you see what I will do to Pharaoh. One can infer the war with Pharaoh and his downfall you will see, but you will not see the war with the 31 kings in Eretz Israel, as you will not be privileged to conquer Eretz Israel for the Jewish people. Now just keep in mind, we know there are 31 kings. Um, I, don't, I do have the verse here. Go to number 7 on, for, on page 3. Um, Joshua chapter 12 over there, I'm not sure what verse it is, um, but he says over there, all the kings are 31. So one of the kings is Tirzah, and all the kings altogether are 31. We know there are 31, let's say, uh, smaller kingdoms within, within the land of Canaan, and that's where the war happened with Joshua, with the 31. Okay? Now, why, well, I mean, there's going to be a question. The clear card is going to ask. Why do you even have numbers? What's the difference between 7 or 31? Why do you have the word kings at all? If you think about it like this, it should have just said, you won't see what I'm going to do to the seven nations. So, what it could have just said was, Lo asoy al shiva you will not see what I'm going to do to the seven nations. Now, there is a medrash, biyakut masik, it's quoted, the lo tiret asher ese bil mechemet shloshim ve'echad malachim, and that's what we also mentioned is in the um, Gemara in Sanhedrin. Um, it says specifically thirty-one kings. So this is his question: Minyon lamali, why do I have a number at all? And I want to tell you, I don't think he even answers this question. But I found a Ben Yehoyada, um, the Ben Yishchai a beautiful piece, which is number three on the source sheet, and we will get to it. But I don't want to do it now. I just want you to remember the question. Why do we even have, number one, why did you mention kings? Why is there the number, uh, well, at least seven we understand. But what's 31? Why bring that up? And he, he even strengthens the question by saying, It's a question mark, exclamation point, which really means... It's rhetorical. It's true we didn't even know that yet, but we eventually will know. It doesn't even need to be said. That's one question. Vaod kasha, another question, the word ata, right now. In other words, why does it say ata tira selaparo? Why does it say now? I'm going to show you. So he's stressing the word ata lamali. Why do I need to know that he's doing this now? I mean, he's going to show him now. Afapisha sof parsha shmos. Even though the clear card himself goes at length to explain at the end of the parsha why the language Ata is used. Nevertheless, he's now going to give us a completely different explanation. As I mentioned already, there are many explanations. We don't say this is the only thing, this is the only way. It has to be a legitimate opinion by one of the sages, whether in the Medrash, whether in the Talmud, um, through the transmission. Okay, here we go. We're about to begin the answer. 
Kiyamar Kadosh Baruch Moshe. What was God conveying to Moses when he says, Ani Hashem, I am Yud Kei He's saying, I am Hoya Hoya the year. I am all existence. I am what was, what is, and what will be. All time. When it comes to the Son of Man, when it comes to flesh and blood, there's no way that anybody is able to fulfill, right? You can never be sure that the person standing in front of you will ever fulfill his promises. How do I know? In fact, maybe today you're here and tomorrow you're gone. And I'm sure you had good intent. So it's based on a verse in Psalms 103, verse 16. I do have that as number 8. As the verse says, King David says, For a wind passes over him, and he is no longer here. Ki ruach ovrabo ve'inenu. It's just a play on words. But human beings will not last forever. Al kein sarak l'kaim altar. Therefore, when a human being makes a promise, the only way the person himself will, could be sure that he can fulfill it is if it fulfills it immediately. And the person listening, the only way you can trust that it can be done is if it's done immediately. So when we think of Hashem, it's a whole nother sphere because He was, is, and will be. And our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, had a tremendous amount of amun and faith. And maybe they, didn't, they knew Him as Shaddai. They knew Him as, and they, but because He didn't fulfill the promise yet. Keep that in mind. But He promised them and they never questioned they knew that he is Yud Kei They knew that he would fulfill his promise in another multiverse, another sphere. Okay? V'im lo, like if a human being doesn't fulfill his promise right away. Zai bedin hamuftachim karim tigar. Therefore, any human being, it would be logical for him, right? Um, he, promises were made to him, so then he has the right to complain. On whatever was not filled immediately. Because if you're going to promise me something and it doesn't happen immediately, I, I, right? The question anybody asks is no, when it's going to happen. No, no, no. Right? Like we all know in Perk Yavot, right? If not now, when? So that was a little play on words as well. But me, I am God. No, I'm not me. Not me. I'm not me. I'm just, right? Playing it out here. We're, we're going through the story. But who Hashem is saying, I am Yudke Vavke. I am eternal existence. We're talking metaphysically. All time is equal to me. All time is equal in the realm of Hashem. And the Avos, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew this, and they didn't complain. But rather they looked forward, they anticipated, they waited forward to the fulfillment of the word of God. When God's word would be fulfilled, because they were assured, they, they had such surety and belief and trust that in the end, whatever Hashem said would be fulfilled. Now God is getting on Moshe's case. Remember, we're talking about God's bringing down judgment on Moshe. Aval ata with an olive, but you, Moshe, karata tigar al shalom niskaimo divrai teke fumiat. You're already complaining. You're already arguing with me. You're already upset that I did not, the, 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 my own words were not yet fulfilled immediately. Remember, he sent them once to, to Pharaoh, and he even told them he's not going to let you go. Mm -hmm. Now, if he told them he's not going to let you go, what, what, what kind of complaint do you have? Because he, he made it worse. Ah, exactly. Now this is the complaint. You made it worse. Now, most certainly you, Moses, you're going to go into the land of Israel with, in place of Joshua, whatever, with Joshua, with the Jewish people, and we already know that the, the war is going to take a long time. I just want to show you if you go to um, Exodus chapter 23, verses 29 and 30, you can see this in number 6. God says, I will not drive them away from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field outnumber you. But rather, what? I will drive them out from before you little by little, 
until you have increased and, and can occupy the land. Imagine if all the seven Canaanite nations were <coughs> slaughtered in a very short period of time. So until this small nation of ours grew, the, the, obviously wild animals, you know, vultures and hyenas and all that, you know, those, well, you know what I mean, all those animals of prey would just come and eat the carcasses, right? I mean, it would be disaster for us, it would be disaster for the land. It would just not be a very a healthy atmosphere for anybody. So Hashem actually made it and even foretold this is going to be, I'm going to use the word a seven year war that could foreshadow something, but it can also be decades, even hundreds of years. I mean, until David and Mela came and finished off the job, so to speak. So we have a lot of patience. I'm going to just show you, go back to number four on page two. And Joshua 11, verse 18. Joshua made war a long time with all these kings. Yamim Rabi Masa Yoshua. So we know that it was not a, what do you call that? Instant gratification, chick chock. Uh, huh? Lightning? It was a lengthy war. It was a long war. It lasted more than six days. It lasted more than six days. <laughs> Very good. So here we have it. And that the, the, ver the verse, let's say before we get to the verse. Uh, the last thing we said was, nevertheless, you, Moses, you would end up complaining um, with the war of the 31 kings. Ki milchamas yitarchu it's going to be proven to be a very long war, by necessity. As Joshua chapter 11, verse 18 says, Yamim rabi masu Yeshua milchameh et melachi me'ilu. It took him a long time. Ki lo yachlu Yisrael lincho et kola eretz mehera that the Jewish people were not able to, and that was God's plan, not to uh, conquer the land so quickly. Pen, as we just quoted in Exodus chapter 23, verses 29 and 30, lest all of these wild animals in the field um, take over. Ela ma'at ma'at, rather slowly by slowly, you will drive them out. Ya'an kidarchecha likro tigar, remember, God is still talking to Moses, because your way, Moses, is to be argumentative, is to complain. When the, when the um, promise is not fulfilled so quickly. Now this is an interesting word. He doesn't use the word punishment as an onish. He used the word kanas. Usually a punishment is measure for measure in its exactitude. A kanas is a, is a, a penalty or a fine of some sort. The penalty does not have to match. When it's a penalty, it could be a lot less or it could be a lot more. It's more symbolic. Yet, Hashem is saying, therefore I'm going to penalize Shebedin lo tire milchama arucha shi'ateim shloshim v'echad malachim. From the judgment, right? From the logic, basically, that you are not going to see this long war that, uh, that the Jewish people are going to have with the 31 kings. Except for what? Chutz mimilchamet paro. Except for the war with paro. Shumelch echad. He's just one king. V'yachol atali wrote, and you will be able to see ata right now. You're going to see it with your own eyes. Ratzol amar tekef. Meaning now, immediately, you will see it. Asher esel paro. What I'm going to do to paro. Oto levad tireh. That alone I'm going to allow you to see. Now, the Iker HaMiyut Bo Min Milat Ota. Miyut means like a, a limitation of some sort, right? A, a, um, a deduction, right? So the prime lesson here comes from the word Ota, which means now. Meaning to say, Dafke Dover Shenesa Ota Tekef Ototire. It's something that's going to happen immediately that you will see. But it's not something that you will not be able to see right now. But only after a long length of days. Like that war that's going to take place with the 31 kings. That you will not see. And that's why he ends up saying, Shmi Hashem, my name is God, God tells him, which is what? Shemayre Shani Hoive Lenetzach. I fulfill my promises. What I say is eternal existence. L'sof havtachtati havtach havtachasi l'skayim. That I promise, right? My promise will be fulfilled in the end. 
And those forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they didn't even know, they didn't, um, they didn't, they didn't get to see that fulfilled, and yet they believed but rather Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who didn't know my name right? they knew who I was in, in, in my real essence even though I didn't reveal myself because I didn't fulfill it in their lifetime but this is something that you need to know Moshe as a teacher now what I want to do is go through some very interesting pieces now, I only have one here I don't know what happened to the other one but uh, you guys don't have it Oh, no, you do, on the last page. We're going to deal with that. I think we should deal with that first. Let's deal with that right now. So on the back page, it's the Gemara from, no, it's the, it's the Medrash. This Medrash in Shmos, it's um, in, in Midrash Rabbah, 5, paragraph 23. It's our verse, the Omer Hashem El Moshe. When I say our verse, it's, it's chapter 5, verse 22. And it says like this. Uh, Hashem said to Moses, Now you will see what I shall do to Pharaoh. So here it says, You will see, But you will not see what I'm going to do to the 31 kings. We asked, What in the world do you need number the 31 for? Right? Wait, I'm going to show you the Ben Yehoyada, and I hope Larry can help us. Uh, because the Hebrew is a little bit difficult, but anyway. But rather, you're not going to see this war with the 31 kings, but Joshua, your, your, your student, he will see, and he's going to exact vengeance for you, not you, but for you, for the Jewish people. It's very interesting that the language here is that Moses, you, you, you actually learn, you take, you're going to take upon yourself. Again, we talked about leadership. Moses took upon himself, the word onish is used, uh, actually not, but it's understood. Um, you're going to take the din, the judgment, not going into the land of Israel. <coughs> Very interesting. So I want to now read to you some of the, the comments on this medrash. So Rabbi Shimon Schwab mentions, um, he asks, he wonders how Moses' punishment that he not witnessed the conquest of Eretz Israel fits the sin of questioning God's practices. He explains that the method by which Israel was meant to conquer the land was one that was slow and incremental, as the verse says, which we read already, right? That rather, little by little, the, the Jewish people would drive them away, um, okay? So the conquest of the land requires patience and deliberateness. And it took seven years to complete. Right? In other words, before they were able to divide up the land into the tribal areas, that was the seven-year war I'm referring to. So Moses' complaint before God had been that this, despite God's assurances, he could not see any immediate improvement in the fortune of the Israelites. This is what Larry mentions. Not only that, it even took a, a turn for the worse. It was horrible. I mean, come on. Now you have to go and collect all the, your own, your own um, ingredients for the bricks? No, because as you said, God told Moses that Pharaoh was not going to let you go immediately. Right. So Moses expected that. Ah. But God didn't say a word about Pharaoh making it worse. Right. And it was worse, so now Moses complains. No. Um, so God took Moses to task for his impatience, motivated beyond doubt by his deep love for the suffering people. This is something we have to understand because we're talking about the idea of a leader. A leader has the empathy, has the, he's carrying the burden of the people. He felt it. And you know what? It bothered him so much. Of course he wanted to see them relieved immediately. But this is a fault in a leader, right? To think, I have to do it and I have to do it now. It's going to happen in God's time and it's going to happen God's way. Okay? Now, in kind, a judgment was issued against Moshe. In other words, almost measure for measure. He would see the liberation that was presently to ensue, but he would not see the conquest of the land for which patience, rather than impatience, would be required. Not only that, indeed, the deliberateness 
with which the conquest of the land was to incur, to occur, is often the mode in which God guides the course of the world, as well as our individual history. His plan is in place of, from the start, but he allows matters to unfold slowly. It's amazing. All you have to do is open your eyes, and you can see the things, right, <laughs> happening before your eyes. But it's not happening in your time. It's not up to you. It happens in God's time, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew that. Moses still needed to learn that lesson for some reason. But what happens when we open our eyes and see, like it's happening now, right? When you, read, you hear the news, right? God builds up. He builds up the evil people because this way, when they fall, it's so obvious, right? It's so obvious. So when the truth finally comes out, right, it just trickles, in, um, trickles out in drops, but all of a sudden, the dam breaks, and everything is so obvious. And that's what's happening now. That's what's been happening for the last four, you know, 5,780 some years. But anyway, each piece of the puzzle falling into place at its appropriate time, exactly the way it was planned out from the beginning. This concept is at the root of the verse. So there's an interesting verse in Psalms, chapter 33, verse 18. And it says like this, Behold, the eye of Hashem is on those who fear Him, upon whose who await His kindness. Patience. Hashem has kindness, and He will show it to those who wait. Right? I grew up in America, and we had a ketchup called Heinz. This is not an advertisement at all. But there was an advertisement, anticipation, right? It took a long time. It was very thick. I don't know what they put into it, but it was very thick and it took a long time to come out. Anyway, anticipation, right? Anticipation. I said, what's the today's generation which was instant gratification? Instant gratification. So it's, anyway, it's a beautiful verse. Look up Psalms 33, 18. Um, the truth is there's a lot more to say, and I have a lot more, but I think it's important, so I'm not going to skip it. I'm going to go over it with you. So at the very bottom of the back page, now the Dubna Magid, he offers an ingenious explanation of our Medrash, according to which the judgment of which the Midrash speaks here is not really a punishment in the usual sense. Okay? But this is, this is we're going to lead into this idea that Moses, by the way, keep this in mind. I want to read, just tell you outside that if Moses or even King David was prevented from building the Beit HaMikdash, if Moses would have come into the land and built the Beit HaMikdash, a Beit HaMikdash that would have been built with Moses' own hand could never have been destroyed. And I'm just reiterating that with David as well. But that's why David didn't build it. But neither did Moshe. We're only focusing right now on Moshe. That Moshe didn't get to build it. If he would have come into the land of Israel, and, and he would have built the Beit HaMikdash. And you know what would have happened? God even says later on, I know you're going to sin, right? You're going to be so satisfied you're going to have so much wealth, and you're for, going to forget me, okay? So as a result of forgetting God, we sin. As a result of sin, the base of Migdash, well, let's just say like this. We're deserving of destruction. And since we're deserving of destruction, so then we would have been destroyed. But you know what? The word Mishkan, which is symbolic of the temple itself, uh, the, the Shechina rests in the Mishkan, that Mishkan is also related to the word um, Mishkon, Mishkan means guarantor, right? That's what you have. The best loan in Israel is a mishkanta because your house, your mortgage, your house is collateral, right? It means collateral. So the mishkan is the collateral for us. And therefore, God forbid, when we sinned and we deserved a, a, a very harsh punishment, God did not take it out on us, but instead he took it out on wood and stone. Now imagine if Moshe would have built the Beit HaMikdash that could never have been destroyed, then God forbid, we know the result would have been, perhaps, our destruction. So in a sense, Moses took the burden on himself. You understand? And that's where the, um, where the, the Dubna Magid, I, I believe, is going. And let's hear it. So he begins by the questioning the language of our Midrash. If indeed the Midrash speaks of Moses being punished, then why does it use the phrase that Moses took upon himself? Remember, I pointed that out. 
in the Medrash, it doesn't say Moses was punished. It says Moses took upon himself the punishment, the din. What does that mean? Which literally, which literally translates, now Moses took hold of the judgment. Why not express it rather, God passed judgment against Moses, which is more like how we would talk. So he's claiming, the Midrash teaches us, that it was for the benefit of Israel that Moses refused, sorry, that God refused Moses' plea to enter as Israel. For Moses had to die and be buried outside of the land, so that with him, in, the, in his merit, the Israelites who died in the wilderness, we call the Dor Hadea, that apparently, in the future, they will enter the land of Israel when the resurrection of the dead happens, and Moses is going to lead him into the promised land. So there is a Gemara that says, how do we know that resurrection of the dead is from the Torah? Now that question could mean, where do we know the proof? Or how do we know it's the Torah itself? You keep the Torah. And that applies for non-Jews as well. They keep the seven Noah high laws, that's their Torah. And for Jews, they're 613. That if you keep, if you, the Torah itself, the mitzvahs you keep, gives you chius in the world to come, and gives you chius, gives you life in the resurrection of the dead. Another, like the other question is, um, believing just, believing that the Torah is from heaven. Okay, I want to move forward, sorry for that um, digression. But there's another explanation here that I want to read you. The Duba Magni therefore explains that indeed, in order for those who died in the wilderness to enter the land upon the resurrection of the dead, some extraordinary tzaddik had to die and be buried among them. But the tzaddik could not have been someone other than Moses. Now one second. I said, I should have said that. that it could have been a different tzaddik. Right? It could have been a great Hasidic person who lived at the time. Why did it have to be Moses? Let Moses come into the land of Israel and let some other tzaddik who passed away during those 40 years be the one to lead the Jewish people into the promised land in the resurrection of the dead. However, as stated in the preceding section of the Midrash, Moses himself, as a leader, he exhibited an overpowering love and devotion to his people. So much so, he was brazen enough to challenge God on their behalf and to point Go ahead. Uh, have a good Shabbos. Okay. Yes, yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Have a good Shabbos. I'll see. Okay. Uh, and um, so much so that he was brazen enough to challenge God on their behalf to the point that the attribute of justice sought to harm him. But God did not allow harm to befall Moshe. In fact, that's why it says, Ani Hashem. Right? God saw mercy. This person had such altruistic value, right? Um, he loved the Jewish people so much, he was willing to give his life for the Jewish people. Just the willingness. This is what a leader should do, right? And I'm going to show you another piece soon. This is why Moses was so um, beloved um, by the people himself and especially by God. This was and would be the hallmark of Moses, whose life meant nothing to him when the fate of his, of his beloved people were at stake. Okay, that's an amazing point there. Now I want to skip to another piece. Now you don't have it, but um, this is um, one of the notes in the Medrash that speaks about what exactly makes a Jewish leader. And um, this is written by Rav Simcha Zissel Ziv, the altar of Chelm. And I'm just going to summarize and paraphrase just some very important points. Um, his book explains in Hakma Musar is they reveal Moses' prodigious capacity to empathize with other people, the trait that qualified him to become the savior, savior and leader of God's chosen people. So that's going to be the main point. That is the main ingredient that, that makes a leader. And I'll even say the Mashiach, right? So empathy... Okay, empathy, chesed, and, uh, and charitable acts. These are all going to be the levels. If you can attain these levels, let's just start. Empathy is a fundamental attribute of righteousness, the catalyst of which many forms, uh, of many forms of virtue. It's a catalyst of many forms of virtue. Among three levels of ben benevolence is the highest and most difficult to attain. The first level is called tzedakah. This is giving money. 
Then there's acts of chesed, which is kindness, which is not just to poor people. It could even be wealthy people, right? Anybody and everybody, and not just with money, which are motivated, motiva motivated by the desire to benefit other people, even when such help does not fulfill fill an actual need. And finally, there's empathy. Empathy where one gives to his fellow more than just money, objects, or help. He gives of himself, surrendering his own identity to feel his fellow's pain or joy and to share in it as if it were his own. Uh, that's really where I, I think that uh, I don't want to overburden you, right? But we do know that what Moses saw, right, it says he observed their burdens. And he went down from the palace and he went out to help the people. And this was something we would say he was truly altruistic. I mean, he gave up his entire life. And he was willing to give up his entire life. Again and again. Again and again for the Jewish people. So that is what makes a true leader. And there's a lot to be said about it. I don't want to overburden you with time. We try to keep the class one hour. Um, so I want to, I hope you stay till the end. Um, and we would always welcome you back to next week. Um, I hope you will review this with the Hebrew. Learn some Hebrew. Just review it. You have to over and over and over again. These are, we always talk about fundamental concepts. I hope we did cover some fundamental con concepts. It always bothered me how Moses could not enter the land of Israel just because he hit the rock instead of talked to the rock. It's such, you know, that point was really what sealed the deal because he didn't cause the people to believe in, 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 in God, right? Mm -hmm. There was something about that, that if he would have. In fact, interestingly enough, the clear card says, when we see that, um, we see that Joshua caused the sun to stand still, how did Joshua do that and Moses didn't? Where does it say in the Torah that Moses caused the sun to stand still? It doesn't. But we know that he did. In, in one of the final wars with Sichon and Og. Okay? So he did. And the, the logic is that if the student did it, the teacher for sure could have done it and did it. And it was right after the war of Sichon and Og that Moses then begs and prays. He thinks God will change his mind because he did what he failed to do earlier on. When God said, speak to the rock, instead of hitting the rock, first of all, what was his sin? You think his sin was speaking to the rock and not hitting the rock? No. His sin was not demanding that the rock give forth water without even speaking to God. A leader takes responsibility and, and sees the burden, sees the need, and a tzaddik can, make, we'll call it, can, can command the blessing. The tzaddik speaks and it's decreed. He's at one with God. He knows what God needs and wants. I shouldn't say need. God wants. God wants the Jewish people to be, have water. Moses could have said or should have said, without talking to God, rock, bring forth water. And it would have happened. Mm -hmm. And that was the sin. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine not living up to your potential is a sin? And unfortunately, we see in today, this, this week, I don't want to mention too much because it's not my place. That someone who was seemingly doing so much good in this world, and then we don't even know what to believe, but let's just assume the narrative, we don't know. Somebody like that ends up finding, you find out that there's so much negativity, and then they, they take their own life. The biggest sin is not living up to what you, you could have. And if all this story is true, that if he would have faced the music, which I'm sure was painful, right? If he would have faced the music, as they say, and people begged him to do tshuva, and if he would have done tshuva, we have no idea the greatness that would have come out of it. We have no idea. We have no idea. But we know that uh, we're, all, we're bus of Adam, and we, fa we're, we sometimes fail. Um, but anyway, it should all be a kapara. We should all grow and uh, constantly try to find out, you know, who we are, what our mission in this world is, become more empathetic, benevolent, charity, full of charity, feel the burden of our people, and let's act on it. Let's do something about it. And with that, we'll see you next week and have a great life.